Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Paul Rogers, Curator of Public Programs and Education here at the Museum of Art and Design, Miami Day College. And I'd like to welcome you to today's MOAD Talks, Lyndon Norton, Hot Pink and Secrets, What's in a Box? Lyndon Norton is a curator, writer, and part-time professor of art history, theory, and criticism. She has spent the better part of the past decade teaching in the MFA programs of Columbia University, Yale University, and Hunter College, and most recently in the BFA and MFA programs at Cornell's Architecture, Art, and Planning program, and the BFA and MFA programs at the Malmo Art Academy in Malmo, Sweden. Norden has written about many contemporary artists for Art Forum, BOM, the Art Journal, and for various catalogs and publications. She is on the board and actively engaged in advising the Los Angeles nonprofit space Joan, where she curated an exhibition featuring the experimental film work of Peggy Awesh last fall. And she is at work now on a group exhibition for the Hauser and Wirth Galleries, tentatively nicknamed Animal Friends, which focuses on incidents of animal care and love. Please give Linda Norton a warm welcome. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Rena. And thank you, anyone who has made it into this cold, windowless space full of magical art on a sunny day in Miami. Um, I am new, in a way, to Ren Fridvinson, even though I've been thinking about him for the past year. But um, so this talk, in many ways, is an effort on my part to come to terms with not just what we're looking at, but where and in what form the work best resonates and does its work. Um, so let me backtrack. Though Paul um, gave the title as What's in a Box? Hot Pink and Secrets, which is where I began um, the box. Um, the title of this talk is actually How Do I Know Thee? Full Fathom Frid Finson, meaning Hen. Um, about a year ago, um, a very dear friend of mine named Joe Wolin, an art historian, curator, editor, who works with Rena for MOAD in various capacities, um, and who has for years told me that Rena is a friend that he holds in the same emotional <laughs> valence that we have. Um, we went to graduate school together. Um, he asked me if I would want to write on an artist named Hen Fridfinson. And I had never heard of Hen, um, which I was later sort of chagrined to admit. But I said, I take forever to do anything in writing. I take forever to know my own thoughts. The only way I can think is in teaching and in curating. Um, but let me look. And he sent me online the catalog for the Geneva exhibit from which this show was um, uh, a sort of culled. Um, it's, it's, a, it's its own version of that show. And I kind of toggled from image to text and had difficulties finding any consistent line. But what I landed on at the very beginning was this box called Source. Mind you, this is the spring of 2021. We're deep, we're in the middle of COVID and we're not in a pause. We're in kind of the worst of the second round. And like most Americans, for sure, I was inundated with boxes, boxes used for really ridiculous things, like a big box for a little tube of eye cream. 
But this particular photograph of this particular object just did something to me. I was completely captivated by the fathomlessness of the simple gesture of gluing day glow paper into a cardboard box. And I was intrigued. The next work that sort of captured me, I thought, okay, I'll have a look. And then I read about this work, and I just looked at this one photo. You can see behind you, and a lot of the works that I'm going to refer to are in, in the show. Um, and I want to, to leave a little time at the end because I'm going to use that big room next door with some of those works to actually look at the work themselves because I want to play the way the images play against the actual work. So this Five Gates for the South Wind introduced me not just to Hen's imagery or an image idea, but to a, a voice. And suddenly the artist was introduced and I had a feel not just for the way he made something, but for the way he thinks. And the description of this gate was that it was made for a particular wind in a particular spot, and the gates were made, there were five, so that they would open only when that wind happened to blow. And that involved an engineer, so that introduced another element, that he's interested in these ephemeral, elusive phenomena and involve incredible specialized labor and production I mean, I can say more about that later. Hen's modesty. So the next thing was this idea that he's enlisting um, specific thinkers um, and specific types of thinking to create a simple object that relates to objects he knows in his life to do just one little thing. And the five gates to the wind, to the, for the south wind, it, they got built, they got sighted in a, in a remote Icelandic site, and they got photographed, and he never visited them again. Um, so th there is that just, the, the, I, so this describes an aspect of the work that I began to kind of try to wrap my mind around that I was intrigued by, which is just, a, an infatuation or an intrigue on his part with something elusive, something that can't be grasped but is noticed, and something that is desirable on a certain level, minus any of the critique or the, the, the need to make a comment on something else. It's just uh, capturing that, that, that thing. And the next step for me, in a way, was to try to understand, and this became much larger, but at the moment, what was selling me on the artist were these two works and others related, which I'll come back to. Um, and so I said to Joe, okay, I'll write. I was really, really nervous, and I haven't lost that. Because the next thing that I encountered is the way, what happens, I'm an art historian, I'm trained as an art historian, I love theory, I love history, I love literature, I'm comfortable when I can talk about somebody both directly but also to invoke the language of others whom I value, who, who can speak in better or other ways. But I'm also often really annoyed, or irritated, I should say, by reading multiple essays on an artist. I, the art catalog is a very unusual animal. There's really nothing like it. And very often, essays repeat themselves, or the, you, you read and you hear the same things told over and over, and often, there's an emphasis on saying, how shall we categorize this artist? I mean, it's, it's a kind of common thing to complain about 
being categorized. It's always better to be uncategorizable. But, but there's a lot, you know, there is something desirable about saying, for example, with Chen, um, is he a romantic conceptualist or a um, magical conceptualist? or as Hans Ulrich Oberst, a curator, said, an emotional conceptualist. And then, how is he a conceptualist? So all those, you know, those, those things are bouncing around in my head, but I felt a certain irritation. That was my second emotion. I wanted, I thought, okay, this is going to be Hans' first show in the United States. I mean, he, he was in a group show at the Guggenheim in the 70s. But it's going to be his first show in the United States. It's an incredibly unusual time in our history. How do I deal with this artist who appears to be a maverick, but who is sort of fetishized almost by a certain group of um, European artists? So then I have to back off that emotion. And now let me try to narrate something a little bit more chronological, just to take some givens. Chen is born in the 40s. He's a, um, an Icelandic artist for whom coming from Iceland is, is deeply important. When you talk to him, one of the very first things he says to you is, I'm a farm boy. He wants to underscore the fact that he begins with simple, direct experience, not learned experience, not, not book experience, but then reading and book experience and science and all that cultivated knowledge very quickly becomes of interest to him too. So anyway, the point that I'm trying to make is that, that Ren is an Icelandic artist who's art historical biography involves going to art school in the 50s, an art a craft academy, studying fairly traditional art, and then get, making his way to Reykjavik, creating a group of artists, cultivating a kind of avant-garde type thing in the 70s. So we move from the 50s to the 70s. He's in art school in the 60s. And then in 1971, or in the late 60s, I should say, in Reykjavik, so he's already kind of a hip artist then, and he has art friends, and he shows in their magazines, and there's a lot of attention. But there's a shift from a vocabulary of traditional art to conceptual art that happens in the late 60s into the early 70s. And in 1971, he moves to Amsterdam, where he's been ever since, and he becomes part of the art scene in Amsterdam in the 70s, which is very sophisticated in many ways. And there are artists that he's really drawn to there. Um, I will mention one of them because that artist is of interest to me. So another thing that became really interesting to me early on was the way in which Ren actually uses conceptual art, other art, um, but specifically the, the means of conceptual art, simple means that are not about the value of the object or about the complication of the process, but rather, and well, let me leave it at that, and he, that he adopts those means in the same way that somebody might adopt a more traditional artist's practice. Um, but he, but he adopts these means completely toward his own purpose and without much that is usually assumed to be part of conceptual art, like what I mentioned before, critique or um, a kind of anti-art. Um, it, it, it's in the spirit of the American artist Bruce Nauman for, who said to find a problem figure out the way to make it, whatever works. And, and on some level, it, Chen is like whatever works plus magic, plus something, you know, an extra something. It's like the ingredient your grandmother never told you when she gave you her recipes that made it what it is. Um, that's not a good analogy. Anyway. The, the irritation, just to speak to it more specifically, because I mean it more specifically, had to do 
with um, a celebration of Chen. Wait, let me back up. The, the 1970s is a period of a lot of the work you'll see here. It, it struck me as I looked at the work that a lot of work, the work that we most identify with Chen, things that are perceived as major pieces, and I'll talk about a couple of them in a minute, um, happened in the 70s. And then there's another period in the 90s where Chen has a lot of European shows and is recognized in many different museums. And then the moment that I'm talking about, probably because I have a relationship to it, takes place in the early 2000s where um, the curator Hans Ulrich Obrist, inspired by a friend, the, um, the Icelandic artist um, Olafur, the Icelandic artist Olafur Eliasson was really enamored of Chen. And so whenever this older generation, a younger generation artist takes an interest in an older generation artist, that interest tends to multiply. And um, in 2007, Chen was given an exhibition at the Serpentine Gallery in London by the curator Hans Ulrich Oberist. And um, you know, what's Kitty's last name? There was another curator involved in, in the. No, no, no. Or did she curate a different? It was curated by Hans Ulrich Only, OK. So, um, and, and one of the things that really intrigued me, a little anecdote that might speak to what I've taken too long to talk about, is a work that Chen did very early on in the, when he was still in Reykjavik, um, entitled, I, Col I mean, it, it, it was, its title is what it does. It's called I Collect Personal Secrets. And if you look at this magazine, which is an art magazine that he had work in, H2O, that he did with some friends, um, other friends, it's a tiny little line. I mean, do you see it on the image? Can you see right here? I collect personal secrets. Please send yours to me. Look, I'm looking forward to learn and keep them carefully. So it, it's a wonderful little, you know, it has an exclamation point. You can feel his enthusiasm. It, it speaks to his emotion. Um, and uh, he, sa he gives his own name. You know, he doesn't even try to be anonymous. There's nothing creepy about it. He got very, very few responses to this. But later, when this work is singled out, by a curator of the kind of import of Hans Ulrich Obrist, he gets many responses. And he makes the work that you see right there to the right of the monitor, um, which shows what he did with those secrets. He was indeed, he did indeed keep them very carefully, because not only did he keep them by forming in them with, with glue, you, you'd be hard put to take any one of them out of there, um, into a work that has aesthetic appeal, he kept them secret. Um, and I, I kind of loved both the fact that, that he needed the amplification of art world attention to sort of get the response, but that he held on to this wonderful kind of more uh, playful um, early and, and innocent um, relationship to the work. So uh, that was just to mention Hans Ulrich. The next, um, the next thing that captured my attention, and I'm going to read this, but this, this is a text that pertains to this photograph. Um, so I will go back to the text because I want to read it. Together, it's called Elsewhere, and it's a piece from the 90s. Together with my brothers, we were driving, and I noticed through the window in the back an extremely attractive light situation. So I asked my brothers to stop. An extremely attractive light situation. I love that. They returned to stop at this moment. Oh, they refused to stop at this moment for making some photo, it seemed. It was total nonsense to them since they wanted to be home as soon as possible. 
This led to a conflict until they finally gave in and stopped the car. When I went out to take the photo, the light I'd been drawn to had changed due to the delay this quarrel caused. The sun was closer to setting. Now, I mean, that's a kind of duh, but I have, I'm reading it because I, I really fell in love with Hun's writing. And it's the kind of writing where you just, you don't want to add anything to it. You just want to, uh, Ivana Baga said that in a talk she gave here earlier recently. You just, you don't want to sort of contaminate it with further interpretive reading. But nevertheless, he makes a photo and it's quite evocative. I mean, it's evocative in an, in an unart sort of way. Um, it's not a home photograph. I mean, I've, I've thought a lot about what do these things do? And do they do them better in print or do they do them better projected with light behind them? Um, because light is so much a phenomenon in his work. Um, but anyway, I, I, I love that. And then I had also fallen in love, even though I chastised myself for maybe being receptive to the romantic images, but a later work, um, I don't know, this same year, 1998, that's called um, Enchantment 2, I mean Encounter 2, sorry. And, and I'm a curator who feels the encounter is the most important moment with the art. It's, it's when and where and how you see what you see that matters. Um, but I love this. I love, you know, it's a, you can think of any number, you can think of Aja, you can think of all the artists for whom a reflection and the, the doubling of images add a poetic dimension. You can think of the beauty. Uh, there are all kinds of ways you might think you've seen this before. And yet in the context of Hen, the number of things he manages to get into the layering of this image is just beautiful. He has this gorgeous sculpture, I don't know who it is, um, of these images of sort of pathos um, or, or, or deep sadness or possibly shame. Um, so he has the head and the hands and then the more kind of stereotypical image behind that figure. He has the window, which I'm going to talk about a little because the window figures largely, you can see here, a version, um, in Hen's work. And then he has the blank, which is um, encounter three, or four, or five, or six. Um, it's whatever might get projected. It's the after image. It's the possibility. And all of these things, so much of what Han uses, they're like, not cliches, they're just givens of, of a certain vocabulary in conceptual art, or you can think of Andy Warhol, and you can think of his incredible um, most wanted men portraits that were made for the New York World's Fair in the 60s. And they were censored by the then governor of the state of New York, and he painted over them in silver. And from that painting over them, he thought the blank is an interesting thing. And he took the blank and often made diptychs where he would have a scene of horror, a race riot in, in, in Birmingham, and then he'd have a blank next to it. The blank is a much more familiar trope in literature when you think of the empty page and you think of something to come. But with Han, it's just a possibility. Everything's available. There's the cardboard box and there's an empty frame. And yet in the images that he does make, I'm repeatedly amazed at how many things he gets in. And the, the several times I've now been able to see actual work, because this is my fourth visit to this show, some things work better for me than others. Some things seem to actually make use of the device that he's thinking about, and others fall kind of like with a, not a thud, but they just go, mm, for me. 
Um, and some of that's subjective and some of it's just that he's always experimenting. So this is where Han says one should begin a chronology about his work. It's a piece called Drawing a Tiger. It's made in 1971, so he marks that Amsterdam year as a beginning, even though the Icelandic years are clearly important. And, and he says of the drawing of a tiger, he had no real interest in the drawing or what it took for the drawing. And so there's a kind of beautiful statement that maybe gets lost in um, the fact that when he's drawing that tiger in 1971, he doesn't need to know how to draw. Um, whereas in 1952, that might have been something that really mattered to him as a child. And, and he sets this out in one of the, the conventions of conceptual art, you know, the, the sort of multiple framed, modest, simple photographs, black and white, um, with a text or a label that has equal weight to the image. Um, but in addition, an image like this introduces a passage of time. Um, which in a much more poetic way, you know, m many more poetic ways is, is a constant in Hen's art. And he is an artist who continually returns to things that he's done, um, to, to rethink them, to look at them in a different way. Um, the recursiveness in his art is, is in incredibly enriching. Um, and it can sometimes be, it's, it's not repetitive, but it can remind you of the ways we continually encounter a lot of the same things as we go through our lives. So there's, there, there are magical um, aspects to that recursiveness, and there are more mundane, or I don't know, I'm making too much of that, but I, but I feel like there's something in that. Um, this is just an example of what you know, might have fallen between 54 and 71 of something that he also left behind that the, the curators at Geneva thought they should put in, a, a self-portrait. And I put that in, and I put this one as well. Um, the title of this, I, I have to always write down. Um, wait, they were, ah, I forget the title. Um, um, but, but he refers to this as his multiple selves, um, and it's made in the 90s. So, um, whoop, sorry. What I wanted to get at with these is just, Hen's work is, a, he is not a subject in his art per se, but his biography, the way he knows the world, the way he sees what he sees at a given time, is always in there. And, and the, the recurrence of these self-portraits or some acknowledgement of himself, I, I find really endearing. Um, it's a reminder in a way. It's as if he's reminding himself. And the fourth work, that, whoops, the fourth work that I wanted to include in that string, I'm gonna leave for you to look in the space itself, but it's the, the um, Huldik, uh, the, the huge box piece that, um, yeah, Huldekletter, Huldekletter, which is the hidden cliff, sorry, which is the, the big box construction in, in the large room, which is a, also a kind of autobiography in a way, but an autobiography that's not a declaration of ego. It's, it's, it's a kind of sublimation of ego, but it's an acknowledge, I should say an acknowledgement of, of one's unique perception, one's, one's, right, and history. And it complicates the representation. It's, it's actually um, an incredible, it's one of his most major works because it uses the mathematical principle of the Fibonacci series, which relates geological and bio, you like the Fibonacci series? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Yeah, exactly, the spiral. I love my, I was saying yesterday, Sebastian is in a, a class where I just got to teach some classes here for Rena, and we were at the uh, Paris Museum, and I was talking about a Rouché um, painting that was in a poetry and surrealism show, and that, that just said, words without thoughts ne'er do heaven go from the Tempest, which is, was made for the Miami-Dade Public Library, and he also, Rouché does, um, revisits work and phrases and aspects of his work repeatedly. And he's an artist I've worked intensively with and feel more comfortable talking about. But, he, but he's also interested in this kind of circle, which is actually a spiral. And I mentioned a definition my dad, who was an engineer mathematician, gave of the spiral that I always found really useful. And it's that it's the only geometrical figure that maps directly onto itself except for one dimension. And I feel like that, um, Ronnie Horn, who is an American artist who spent half her life in Iceland, who was enchanted by Iceland at a very young age, whom I knew very, very young. I knew from the time she was a teenager and have followed and written about and whatever, but one of her earliest works was a map of Iceland in which um, she has just the map itself and then on the back is a spiral and she correlates the spiral with Iceland. But so, so that was another idea that I wanted to share about Hen. And then I wanted to talk about a different type of influence or the way I, it's interesting to me how much he takes from other artists where you could say, oh, that looks like, oh, that looks like. And yet there are only two artists, to my knowledge, whom he consciously makes homage to in a title in his work, Duchamp and Mondrian. And independent of Duchamp, he's very enamored of the window. Um, not necessarily in the Renaissance sense, uh, well, maybe yes, maybe no, I shouldn't dismiss it, but, but the idea of inside, outside, the idea of what's in the head versus what's in the world and the forces at play and the way those things, the way the head and the body is a kind of semi-permeable membrane through which things are always traversing back and forth. Um, that's very, very present in Hen's work. And this, which looks to me like a painting, is actually a photograph that he makes. And it's titled, um, First Window, Homage to Marcel Duchamp, an homage to, ooh, where did my Duchamp, what happened to Fresh Widow? <laughs> Sorry, out of order. Um, to the Fresh Widow, to Duchamp's um, play on words, which is much more ironic, um, but there's irony in Hen's work. He has an incredible sense of humor, and um, it, it uh, you know, Duchamp is, is commenting on, on um, well, he's just making a pun, and he's taking a, an age-old device of Western art and turning it back into an obfuscating object um, that reflects rather than reveals or opens onto. Um, I'm not talking about mirrors per se here, and they're so central to Hen, but there's lots you can find. I mean, what Hen makes of the mirror is another kind of magic. Um, and and the, you know, he totally avoids um, Narcissus. He totally avoids the idea of the mirror as, as the device that brings us to ourselves, except for the elusiveness of the actual myth of Narcissus. Um, but I want the, the other artist that he makes conscious reference to is Mondrian, and it's less explicit. Um, it's, uh, he, I mean, he does have, the, this is a piece that is an homage to Mondrian in which he's holding glass and, and conveying the colors with which Mondrian is 
directly associated. And yet, um, uh, uh, sorry, this is what happens when you don't write your talks, and I don't usually write my talks, but I'm often a little better. Um, what I wanted to say about Duchamp, though, a concept of Duchamp's that's not usually mentioned in anything I've read on Hen, which seems to me absolutely crucial, whether he consciously references it or just knows it, is um, the concept of enfremence or infrathin, the idea of something that is, it exists just enough to make you know it's there. Um, but it, it can't be contained, it can't be framed, it can't even, it, it can be named, but the naming doesn't account for the experience of it. So examples of enfremence would be, I um, mean, Duchamp's examples tended to be bodily and sexual. In a French, it, two people smoking cigarettes, exchanging a French kiss. The smoke goes from one mouth to the other. It's en France. The, the gook that comes out of your navel or between your toes, en France. It's stuff that's inexplicable, that exists, that's stinky and evidence of the fact that you are a corporeal being. But it, you, don't know where you, you don't know when it came or how it came. You just know it's there, and you don't know what it means. Um, and, you know, Hen consistently says he doesn't care what it means. He's interested in the experience. I mean, those things can sound like cliche. I was going to read him saying it because he says it so much better himself. But the concept is there. So an artist that comes closest to Han for me, an artist that I asked about, I, I, I should backtrack and say that in addition to being given an online catalog, I was given a phone number and a Skype address for Han and told that I could call him. And I was very nervous about this because, as I say, I've never, uh, Ivana Bagu, who I keep mentioning because I really loved her lecture and I love what she wrote, and if I were going to write something theoretical, it would come to where, more where she did in her essay than her talk. But um, uh, she begins her essay by saying uh, she, her relationship to Han was like a blind date. And mine was as well. I had never as I said, heard of him, I was told how wonderful he was. I was told he was charming. And when I called, very nervous, um, he was indeed incredibly charming. And I proceeded to talk to him almost every week through the fall. Um, he wanted to talk. And the conversations repeated a lot of what I'd read in the catalog. But the way he said what he said was always incredibly endearing. And at a certain point in the fall, um, I asked him about um, Baz John Otter, a Dutch conceptual artist who went to school in California, who has the kind of savvy and art world recognition right out of school in the 70s and 80s that, that um, Ren did not. Um, his father, um, and, and who was not really that well known when I was in art school, you know, in grad school in the 80s. In the 90s, he was, a kind of, he was a kind of cult hero to a number of people here. And I did a show when I was curating at Harvard that um, he was really essential to. And um, I, I was just, as with Han, I was so taken by just the quality of the language, the specificity of the language, the beauty. And here, here are a few random examples. Um, thoughts unsaid that, and, and what they described. Um, the, the piece, Primary Time, he too made direct homage to Mondrian. And the piece on the bottom left corner is called Primary Time. Um, this, is, this is a version of the piece. It was a video, and then he made a, a photographic version. And it was a simple problem that he set for himself. And I'm showing this because it's really distinct from Ren, 
But when I mentioned Vaz John Otter's name to him, he was just silent. And he said, oh. And he said, I will tell you a story. And he told me the story of how he went to a Dutch gallery in maybe in the early 80s or late, called Art and Project. And there was this beautiful boy, young man, dressed in black, sitting by a table with a book. And, uh, and then, then he went on to describe the, the project. Um, it wasn't the piece, I'm Too Sad to Tell You, which um, is the most, whoop, I'll get to that one next, this. Um, which is a postcard and was done in many variations, but it was a version of that kind of, it was another work in which he stages an emotion that's impossible to convey, but he theatricalizes it, he stages it. That's something that Hen doesn't do. Primary time is closer um, to something I can see Hen doing. It's more programmatic, it involves a bouquet of flowers. This is not good color, but neither are Buzz John Otter's prints. Um, so the top left photograph uh, shows a bouquet of red, yellow, and blue flowers. And the assignment that he gives himself is to systematically remove all but one of the colors, one at a time. So first he removes everything but red, then he removes everything but yellow, and then he removes everything but blue. And, and that's the project. And uh, you know, as with Hen, it's not about a meaning, it's about a state. It's a, you know, it's a word that I need to find. It's a, what is it? It's, it's about, it, and this is different from friend. It's not about a, a kind of ungraspable distance or a thought too large to, to grasp, but it is, he is one of the artists who was labeled emotional conceptualist in that he's trying to figure out how do you convey emotion in a work that does not involve making you emote in the same way. It actually states it or describes it. It puts it out there as a thing. I'm, I'm very fascinated by that. Um, another artist that, that actually was, I learned because I asked her, <laughs> who thinks very, very highly of Ren, Forgive this terrible photo, but this is a work that was called You Are the Weather by Ronnie Horn. And I'm showing these to say things that Hen's close to or that seem close to what I love in Hen, but to say what he's not. Um, so this is a work that Ronnie made early during her years in Iceland, photographing a young woman that she knew and whose face she loved um, coming out of the water in all kinds of weather, in pools and, and um, waters all over Iceland, um, which there are. And I love this piece so much when it was made, and I couldn't begin to afford any of it, um, that when Freeze Magazine put the photograph on the cover, um, one of the photos, I bought seven issues of Freeze Magazine <laughs> that I could put up on the top of my bookshelf so I could look at it. Um, but I have the same emotional response, and I have to read this from the book, um, to, to um, Tunkustapi, which is a 1998 work by Hen, which, as with, you know, the, which returns to the notion of fences. And, um, whoop, sorry. Let me see, this is much more like I am in a classroom than in a lecture, but you'll have to forgive me. So Tunga Stavi, I just want to read. In the last chapter, I'm, I'm not going to read all of it, but just to give a feel. In the last chapter of Erbigya Saga, it's written that the church at Selingstunga was moved, but the saga does not say why. In the district, however, the following story is told, explaining the motive for, the moving, for moving the church. Many hundreds of years ago, there lived at Silingstunga a very rich farmer who had several children. Two sons of his are mentioned, Arnor and Svein. They were both very promising, but quite unlike each other. Arnor being valiant and aggressive and Sven still and quiet. 
not a strong man. Their temperaments were quite different. Armour was cheerful and fond of playing games with other young men in the valley. They often met at the bluff, and he goes on. And then he ends by saying, Arnar believes that he is being ordained for some purpose because many men investments are standing around. He shouts out saying, Sven, come, your life is at stake. Sven starts, stands up, and looks down the aisles. He wants to run to his brother, but the one standing at the altar calls out and says, lock the church doors and punish the man who disturbs our peace. And you, Sven, must leave us. Well, I, I can't read all of it, but I just wanted to, it goes on and then at the end, a county meeting was held concerning these events and it was decided to move the church down from the hillock closer towards the farm into a hollow by the brook. Thus the farm was directly between the bluff and the church so that never since has a priest been able to see from the altar through the church doors westwards to the elf bluff, nor have such wonders happened since. And I, I love that. And so what does he make? He makes a, a photo, and it's as blurry as this, really, or it's not quite as blurry, but it's not a precise sense of, of this, this area in which a church got moved. Um, which leads me to the piece that, that is most um, frequently identified with Chen. Um, a series of houses based on yet another story. And um, stories are very, very important to, to Chen. Um, in the set, not, not the telling of the story per se, but the, the way a story evokes something without, uh, and, and still, you know, leaves you with the blank at the end, leaves without consuming it, um, so that it can be revisited repeatedly. So the story here was of a very wealthy man um, who envisioned, but, but it, it takes place within a, a migrant population, right? Um, but the story, basically lands on imagining or always wanting to see an inside out house, a house whose interior was the structure and the support, the part that usually faces the world, and whose exterior was the decorative, ornamental, personalized, comforting details that, that we, decorate our house, you know, that, that we embellish that structure with in order to make us feel on some level protected. We have to pretend every day when we go home that uh, if we have the wherewithal, <laughs> that, that, that we have this protection and we do things to remind ourselves that, that there is comfort or protection. But the idea of the in, the exterior inside also creates this fabulous conceit of the world, you know, what the world would see or the elements um, captured or contained or inside. And Han built this house outside Reykjavik on a defunct volcano um, in a place, again, it wasn't a site that he wanted to revisit. He built it and he photographed it. He did invite a poet to come visit and sit inside and read and photograph that. But, but it was, um, it had kind of two lives. One is all of the legend around the idea of it, which happens the minute you hear about it, read the story or see photographs. And the other is the fact that he didn't take it down. So people who had no idea who Chen Friedvinson was, who happened to be in this quasi remote area, stumbled on this confounding house. I should add that there was a neat detail that Han adds about the, the, the man who, the story that he read, that, that man apparently had a real love of ornament. And that sent Han on another jag, I'm just thinking about ornament. Um, 
So this is the first house, and it has a door. And in his already recursive way, um, or just indicating how something came to be, or I should say telling a story, there are photographs of the building of the house in, on the building. Um, which is, I mean, one tradition I know that does that. I worked for a number of years in the Egyptian galleries at the Metropolitan Museum. And in all of those burial um, boxes, they, there are the artifacts of the person who died, you know, that they can take to heaven. But the outside, all those hieroglyphs tell the story of what they, they, they don't only document like inventory, what's inside, they tell the story of the person. So there's different information. I, I love the idea of thinking about these Egyptian sarcophagal boxes as kind of like a cereal box that lists its um, ingredients, but also tells the story. And Hen has that. This is the second house. Um, that was, so the first house is built in 1971. The second house is built in the 90s. Um, and then uh, it's a much cozier looking house, um, but it has documentation inside of the first house. And the exterior is almost as comforting as the interior, I think. The third house, banishes all of that and just kind of deals with the armature of house um, and, and was made um, in the original site of the first house as if nothing was left but the frame, which does still indicate an interior exterior. And that third house then went to, um, wait, is this the fourth house? Sorry, this is the fourth house. A fourth house was made for the German sculpture fair called Munster, which happens with the, the international show Documenta. It's happening this year. Um, and then moved to another spot in Germany. Um, but the house looms large. It continually returns to it for all of the things that it might represent. Um, I, I don't think it's there now. He's moved on to something else, and I'm going long, so I want to just get to the latest project. But there are a couple things I just want to say in between. I'm going to do two more, a few more things. One is I want to read a description, just the first paragraph that one of the students in the Miami-Dade class wrote about Hen's piece, um, a wave of mine and a cloud for my good neighbor, because um, she, was taken not, she was taken by the contrast. Well, I'll read her writing, OK? In a wave of mine and a cloud for my good neighbor, Hen Fridfinson creates a juxtaposition by placing two contrasting images and text next to one another. On the left, there's a black and white image of the ocean and waves forming on the shoreline. Beneath the photograph reads, a wave of mine. To the right is a color photograph of the sky with a few clouds which are slightly being, which are being lit by the sun. Beneath um, the photograph reads what appears to be a continuation of the first sentence on the left and a cloud for my good neighbor. And she goes on to speak to the fact that, that he's depicting something that can't be owned and, and her intrigued by that. So I, I just love that she, that she found that in that. Um, but now I want to go to, I, I've missed one piece that I just want to go back to because I really love what Han did, this one. Um, and it's, it's um, a piece based on a novel of a passage from a novel of uh, Haldor Laxness, one of the most famous Icelandic authors, a Pulitzer Prize winner whose most famous novel was called Independent People and whom I coincidentally found, just coincidentally, it's his birthday today. <laughs> I like that. But, but this is a piece from the 90s where Hun is rethinking formal vocabulary, and I had more I had wanted to say on that, where he's, um, uh, if, if I look at this picture, I think, oh, he's thinking about the artist Eve Klein, and he's thinking about blue in a way that has nothing to do with Mondrian. But in fact, he takes it 
from a passage, I mean, it's, uh, this is just to give you an idea of how precise and how, um, how, what's the word that I want to say, um, inform how literate, how worldly Hen's um, allusions are. He is reading a novel. The novel is um, Laxness's Gerpla. I've never read that. I've read Independent People, which is an amazing book. And, and from that, there is a page in which is mentioned Koblak threw off his smock and pulled off 20 hanks of blue yarn. So it's a piece inspired by 20 hanks of blue yarn from a dialogue between, which, in the, and the writing goes, and then, and then, and then, and then, that, that, that wording in the writing. And it's, it's about a love that, that can't quite negotiate itself. And somehow the throwing down of the hanks of yarn creates an image which Hen reproduces. I, I just love this. I mean, that's the kind of thing that makes me think, yes. Okay, so let's go back to where I want to end because I want you to look at the show still and I've gone on long here. So I asked Hen, is it here? Yeah, by the waterfall. I asked Hen later in our conversations because I was desperate to try to find something to write about that hadn't been written about before. And I said, what are you working on now? And he said, well, I'm working on the fossils. And he's obsessed now with two things, with certain quantum physics phenomena that his assistant said she just can't possibly explain and Hun didn't try either. But he did talk at length about the fossils and he's shown this since in 2018 and then he's got a show that just opened now um, at the same gallery in Amsterdam, in Werk, of a piece called, the, the piece in 2018 was called By the Ocean and the new one is called By the Waterfall. But the subject of the pieces are the objects, these fossils, which he's come to collect. He met a collector of fossils in Amsterdam whom he totally trusts that these things are real. And he's obsessed with the idea of the organic evidence of billions and billions, as what's the name of that physicist used to say, years of life. And he shows it with a photograph. In the initial piece, do I have a photograph of the original one? No. The original one has, um, we have here, has a photograph of a young boy, not his own. And it's, it's about this idea of youth, and he's very obsessed with this idea of the, the, the thinking of a young person. Um, but also of this phenomena of, of evidence, natural evidence in the world, the stones, the water, the things that are aggregated into this fossil, but still exist in, in a greater degree of life um, now that we live with. And I was absolutely blown away by, oh, sorry, by the installation. This one is less good, but I couldn't, I, I, the, the photos of the installation that I liked from the museum, I couldn't get onto my computer. They somehow, the files were too large. So we'll look at the more recent display and you can see a version of it here. What blew me away is that you have the fossil, which is this ancient relic, and you have the photograph, which is not exactly timeless, but suggests a young person and a tiny, tiny scale in relation to the scale of the universe. The one by the ocean, uh, the, the boy, it, it, it has a big sky. You can see it here. But what blew me away was the crystal ball. The fact that between this fossil, what's mediating it is this sphere, this magical globe that distorts and confounds anything you look at through it. So it's just a kind of reminder of, it, 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 it's the humility in the work and it's the magic. And, and I just, I, I love that. And 
Ken has many, many fossils, and he wants to show all of them here. This is from that original. This was the only photograph in that group that I could upload. And then he adds the kind of dorky or nerdy Ken thing, where he has the molecule whoop, of the molecules of oxygen and hydrogen, which make water, <laughs> another substance that he's been very occupied with for years. And if the slides are, this is an aside of Ren at the Venice Biennale, which he did in 1993. And he showed a version of the first house. And, and he showed this piece that we have here, the, the palace um, made of chicken wire, in which he, it's just such a great stroke. It's such an incredibly minimal gesture. And he simultaneously conflates or, or mashes um, the, the humbleness of chicken wire as a material, the fact that chicken wire is an incredibly brilliant fencing material, which uses the hexagon, an incredibly strong um, geometric form, um, and that makes it more malleable than like the chain link fence, but strong. And, and then that it can be cut into these different geometric configurations, which also look like molecular configurations, and that it, he calls it palace. So he should, you know, calls something grand and wonderful. Um, he makes his pal, he builds his palaces of chicken wire. Um, okay, and then the last, I'll end on this note of a work whose title I can't read because they're all Greek symbols for physics, um, physical, physics phenomenon. Um, and it's from a video and it's a very recent work that he's also very occupied with um, that involve um, ways of enacting properties of quantum physics, properties of not just gravity, but the time shifts, the, the, um, the, a concept that only certain minds seem capable of navigating or negotiating, but that really appeal to him. And so his illustrations of these concepts are the hula hoop, the swing, knitting or crochet, and skating. And this, I mean, it's a terrible, terrible photo that I took from the photo that I was sent by Ren's assistant, which I couldn't upload on my computer, so it's like thrice removed. But I love that, that this person wants to skate right up to where the water is not frozen. And the suggestion of this, of this salt, <laughs> the water that doesn't freeze. Um, but just, you know, all of the elements that are drawn into this one image, and it's part of a moving sequence, it's a part of a video, of, of gliding or, or the frictionless move of a blade on ice to skate, and freezing, you know, the states of matter, and danger and scale, and I love that. So I'm going to end very unceremoniously with not an invitation because Rena is the one who could invite, but on behalf of Rena in, in an homage to the show, I, I would love to go or at least have you go into the large room because I want to look at the, the vase on the mirror and the Hilde, the, the, you know, the, the box landscape, and a third piece that I think are kind of what you might call masterworks in, in the oeuvre of an artist whose the word oeuvre is absolutely inappropriate, but in, in, the, in the work of an artist who doesn't make masterworks, and yet every once in a while, he gives enormous thought to absolutely every single thing he does. But every once in a while, he creates a work that 
is larger than all those pieces that you can talk about and take apart. Larger than this inframence or the idea of something that is elsewhere and ungraspable. Larger than, than the, the enchantment even of the dreams or the myths or the things that get recounted in all the works here, which I also love and wanted well, you know, could happily talk about, but um, that are just fathomless on a certain level. And, and I, that, that glass mirror piece and then the gold shelves on the back, the, the back wall of the gallery, which are for, for dust, light, and shadow. And Hun has said, you can read this in the label, that they are um, coated in the most expensive gold. It's the same gold used in church, um, uh, what do you call it? I used to do this, um, uh, gilding. <laughs> Uh, so they're, they're, they're really high end and they can't, you know, and then he, dust he's describing as the residue of meteorites. So there's, there's magic in all of it. And yet it's so literal. Um, I just, I love that. So anyway, thank you. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I hope you enjoy.